I'm Mike Eisman. I'm the uh, Electro-Optical technical, technical Advisor at the Air Force Research Laboratory and the Sensors Directorate at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. Hyperspectral imaging is remote imaging spectroscopy. So what it's about is the ability on a single pixel level to do imaging, but then to capture spectral information for every pixel in the scene in order to do material identification or detection um, or some sort of characterization. Hyperspectral imaging can be used for anomaly detection. Essentially what you do is, is uh, even if you have no a priori information of the material content that you're trying to detect, anomalies or anomalous pixels will show up differently than um, background pixels. Unfortunately, in, in for most applications and backgrounds, there's enough anomalous things out there, rare pixels that are spectrally dissimilar than everything else. And for that reason, anomaly detection really doesn't work too well for most applications because even though you're looking for uh, anomalies, you, the application is usually interested in particular anomalies and you're stuck with all the, all the rare materials and things that you're not necessarily interested in. So to deal with that, even if you're doing anomaly detection, it really helps to have uh, a priori information of what you're looking for. And that's really where the power of hyperspectral imaging comes into play because if you have that a priori information, a, a reference spectrum of what you're looking for, then you can use more sophisticated spectral matching algorithms that not only project away from the background, but also project into the material of interest. In the hyperspectral signal processing field, there's two primary challenges that uh, um, the community is, is uh, attacking very heavily. And one is the atmosphere compensation because the the uh, uh, algorithms really rely on very good atmospheric compensation in order to um, do material identification with low false alarms. The other is in being able to understand when you do target detection the confidence of your material identification um, in order to uh, be able to do target detection uh, in a completely autonomous fashion. What we're really trying to do now is is in particularly in target search applications is to um, alleviate the analyst from having to do that search and have the algorithm do it for them. But there's a lot of smarts that go into spectral analysis that you, now you have to take those smarts and that experience and you need to put that into the algorithm itself. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, with the analyst's understanding of what are the confusing materials and being able to uh, um, decrease the confidence of the result based on the potential confusers and, and potentially similar materials that aren't the target of interest or material of interest. Hyperspectral change detection is an extension of hyperspectral imaging where you use two or more observations in order to help you with your material identification or target detection. And there's really two classes of change detection. One is looking at, at large global changes in an image. So for instance, uh, if you look at uh, uh, urbanization over time and look at a region and look at how uh, development changes the region over time or for instance um, deforest deforestation of an area um, or looking at Great Lakes regions and looking at pollution effects and, and algae blooms and things like that um, where the the object of interest is actually a fairly large scale from an area standpoint large scale change in an image um, that's one class. Um, another class of change detection is when you're looking for small targets um, that have either, you know, been inserted or, or showed up in, in a particular instance or, or observation that weren't there before. Um, that tends to be the this second class of change detection looking at small targets is where my personal research has uh, been more focused on. And the interest there is in a single observation with the uh, complex cluttered background and the small target, it's very difficult to pick out these targets even using spectral information because of the diversity of materials in the background. So the thought is if you have a prior observation of that same area um, but without the target, then at least conceptually you can think about taking these two images, whether they're hyperspectral or not, or not and, and subtracting them and subtracting out all this cluttered background and just leaving yourself with the target. Hyperspectral imaging essentially allows you to detect a particular material uh, within a pixel and if that material content is less than, than a full pixel, 
Um, there are particular algorithms that do hypothesis testing, uh, and instead of the, the, uh, um, the, the test hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis being the presence of that material of interest, you can derive the algorithm where that alternative hypothesis includes the mixture of that target of interest with some background. So when essentially what you're doing in the spectral matching algorithm is you're, you're looking for uh, a particular material direction in your detector that you'll still have even if you have a subpixel target. In terms of illumination, the effects of illumination and, and atmospherics, the effects are really the same as doing a full pixel target detection. Um, but now any small differences in uh, target spectrum relative to what you predicted should be based on your uh, estimated atmospheric parameters will have a greater effect because you have a, a smaller difference between the target and the background. So in order to do subpixel target detection, it puts even higher demands on the ability to do atmospheric compensation than when you have uh, fully resolved pixels or fully resolved targets.